Like a furry torpedo to the jugular, this is Honey Badger Radio, radio with bite. Hello and welcome to Honey Badger Radio. Today's episode is Lions and Bears and College Men Oh My. My name is Allison Tiemann and I'll be your host. With me today is Hannah Wallen, Sage Gerard, otherwise known as Victor Zen, Rachel Edwards, and our new co-co-host, Alice Major. Karen Strawn will be joining, uh, joining us later on. Also with us today is Jonathan Taylor of A Voice for Male Students. There's bad weather rolling into Dallas, so don't be too surprised if we get knocked off air. Until that time, we'll keep on rolling. Now I'm going to hand the mic over to Hannah with the news. In the news on August 22, 2013, Dr. Kelly Leach, Minister of Labor and Minister of the Status of Women, announced the Government of Canada's support for a movement by the White Ribbon Campaign and the Toronto Argonauts in which they claim to, quote, engage men and boys in reducing violence against women and girls in the Toronto area, end quote. The Government of Canada is providing $600,000 for the 36th month project entitled Huddled Up, Huddle Up and Make the Call, a gender-based violence prevention project to teach young men and boys that they are all potential abusers. The White Ribbon Campaign with the Toronto Argonauts Football Club is delivering this message in secondary schools in the greater Toronto area. In other news, a study from the University of California, Davis, has found that uh, a male sex ratio, a male biased sex ratio does not lead to more crime. The study found that rates of rape sexual assault and homicide are lower in societies with more men than women. Kristen Liv Roch, a postdoctoral uh, researcher and co-author of the paper, stated, you may actually adjust your behavior according to the circumstances. When men are abundant rather than rare, they often switch their strategy to compete in nonviolent rather than violent ways. They tend to pursue females in more of a courtship manner that would lead to long-term relationships and marriage in an attempt to secure a partner in a depleted market. Schott, Rush, and uh, Borgerhoff Mulder's study has important policy implications. For example, tough-on-crime policies that incarcerate increasing numbers of men might be contributing to higher rates of violence rather than alleviating them, the authors said. The study is an eye-opener to human behavior interpreting actions based on social environment. Thanks, Alice, for writing up the news. Over to Allison. Just so you know, more information on these news items, including links, can be found on our blog at blog.honeybadgerbrigade.com. Now here's some background for today's show. A school in Michigan was recently ordered to remove a new set of bleachers from their baseball field due to a conflict with Title IX. Parents of the students funded and built the new seating themselves after some of them were having difficulty seeing through the chain link fence. However, their triumph was not to last. The government ruled that this was a violation of Title IX because the new seating was for the boys' baseball field and was now much nicer than the seating put on the adjacent girls' softball field. Instead of upgrading the girls' field, they were ordered to tear down the new bleachers. This came after an anonymous complaint. We must ask how seating that was meant for parents and spectators interferes with student participation and how seating that was funded by those parents and and spectators can be overseen by Title IX, but I guess that's another issue entirely. This is the state of our educational system. They are punishing those that have instead of helping those that don't. The National Coalition for Men is calling flat foul on a martial arts course in Glendale, California. The service has been offered free of charge on state property, property during the month of April. There's just one problem. You have to be a woman to attend. <laughs> 
Um, this is the first time the NCFM has issued a letter asking the state to open the classes to men and boys. The letter states that the lessons funded about by the Commission on the Status of Women violate a host of federal and California anti-discrimination laws. These laws in particular deal with government and agencies participating in activities that promote participation on the basis of gender. Further research is needed to determine if there are federal laws in place to allow the women's class to continue. Now, this is some more information on the Dear Colleague letter. On April 4, 2014, the U.S. Department of Education issued a proposal in the form of a Dear Colleague letter. It was a call to action which, su which suggested that because one in five students was said to be sexually assaulted, that new standards should be set in place to combat the problem of victims failing to report their rapes. The general after-effect of this proposal lowered the standard by which we used to convict a person of rape on a college campus. It replaced the clear and convincing evidence standard with a preponderance of the evidence standard. That is, a 75% plus evidence standard to a 50% plus evidence standard, which only requires them to be just over 50% sure to convict someone of rape. The Campus Sexual Violence Elimination Act that went into effect last month promises to change all that by bringing back a standard that demands evidence for such convictions. However, it faces opposition from a student of the University of Virginia. The victim claims that in her case... She, her case was handled poorly. They suggest that even a preponderance of evidence standard isn't enough to protect the rights of victims in these cases. So if, jury, if uh, tribunals are, not, are less than 50% sure that a, that a man has, convict, is, has done something, has, has engaged in sexual assault, just less than 50% sure they have to convict him in these tribunals. If the preponderance of evidence standards is insane, then a bill proposed in California is practically a nightmare. The passing of which would require men to prov provide proof of enthusiastic consent when facing allegations of assault. The bill, bill would also limit the very concept of nonverbal consent with sexual relations and demand that men have proof of consent throughout sex. That means even if a woman climbs on top of a man and has sex with him without a single word, it will be rape in the, in the state of California. If a law like this passes, it will be an enormous step backwards for human rights and gender relations. If it passes, not even a video of all sexual encounters will be enough to protect men from false allegation. Let's all hope it doesn't come to that. All right, those are our items for this evening to uh, supplement this evening's discussion with, with Jonathan. Is, um, <laughs> they're, they're pretty intense. Um, the idea that we're, we're not just the preponderance of the evidence standard, uh, we're actually going even lower, um, or even suggesting lower, or, or maybe I read that wrong. I could have easily read that wrong. Um, but even the preponderance of the evidence standard, evidence standard seems to be incredibly low in, in this situation. I mean, it's just 50.01% of the evidence suggests that a guy is guilty of sexual assault. And, of course, you have the, the people involved being uh, counseled by feminist and gender studies uh, um, experts who will invar invariably be telling them that a woman never lies. Ugh. Um, yeah, it's pretty and pretty pretty insane. Um, so I'm gonna gonna see. Does anybody want to add to that in the round robin? Want to take over and add something to the the items that have been discussed so far, or we're just gonna keep listening to me? Um, and uh, yeah, the uh, even what's happening with Title IX, like um, the National Coalition of Free Men has has decided to uh, go to 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 launch a, or at least uh, try to get a response to why men can't be part of this this uh, self defense um, this self defense uh, class and this is something that I assume is funded by the government and men are not allowed in it and at the same time bleachers who were that were created by through the efforts of uh, teachers or of uh, participants like, Parents, like completely outside of the system, have to be torn down because the equivalent isn't available to girls. Uh, well, that's, I guess that's that's the government for you. Okay, go ahead, Sage. I feel that um, at, at, after seeing enough cases of Title IX go by, I think there's no matter what commentary I could offer, I think it's just Title IX is just enforced arbitrarily. Now, in the in my experience on uh, Kennesaw State University, they have a rape aggression defense course that they offer 
on campus and they have a similar circumstance where they offer they offer the course to both men and women but the rape aggression defense course for women was founded in 2002 whereas the rape aggression defense for men course was founded in 2012 and although both courses exist on, only the course for women is promoted at a is pro, it's promoted disproportionately more so than the men's course and I have discussed it with legal counsel and have discovered that in, when it comes to federal laws, it is possible for a government agency or a government bureaucracy or what have you to offer a service to both men and women but promote it in a biased fashion and still not be in violation of Title IX. So the idea would be you can have a, you could say you have a service available for men, but you can never tell anyone. You, it's possible for you to not tell anyone about it and it will still be okay because the services are still technically available and oftentimes they excuse themselves for this biased uh, representation and promotion by saying that there's no demand for the men's equivalent service and I believe that this kind of excuse in this kind of hedging would be used to excuse the biased promotion of uh, the biased uh, I guess you could say promotion to women in the uh, Glen city of Glendale for sexual assault awareness month and i'm uh, i'm hoping but i would not be surprised i'm hoping that uh... the ncfm would not face a roadblock of that nature but it would not surprise me if it happened so i'm just going to go ahead and say that between the bleachers between glendale and between kennesaw state university i really do think a lot of it is arbitrary and based on case-by-case -case attempts to equivocate and get out of the way of accountability on the government's part so i'll let the I'll release the floor from there um, one of the major effects that Title IX has actually had over the last, well, since it's, since it's begun, its beginning has been school systems bending over backwards to dodge lawsuits. They've basically made school systems into the, the equivalent of, of human resources departments and businesses. Their interest um, related to Title IX isn't so much determining fairness, um, making sure there's no discrimination, it, it's covering their asses. And it's all they really can do because Title IX's guidance is vague enough that whoever decides they've been victimized um, has every opportunity in the world to just walk in there and, and sue the crap out of the school system and win. And because of that, and I cannot remember the case now, but in my area, it was after I was in high school, uh, after I was out of high school, there was a case where um, there was an activity a friend of mine was involved in that was shut down because, and it was a, it was a boys activity, um, there were a couple of girls who wanted a girls team and not enough to, um, not enough to have a full team. And since there wasn't enough interest for a full girls team, and they didn't want to be on the boys team, the boys team had to be shut down. So they couldn't have either one. And that was because the school was afraid that if they, they could not form a girls team, the girls' families would sue the school for having a boys team and no girls team. Um, so this is a situation where the, the federal government really has forced school systems, school administrators, to, to uh, you know, play dodge, you know, dodge the lawsuit as opposed to actually dealing with concepts of fairness and, and attempting to avoid discriminating against anybody. It, it's not really about that at all anymore. No, well, it, was it ever really about that? I mean, it, there... I don't think the law was. Yeah, it, it like Sage said, it seems to be such a inconsistent sort of um, application of it. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I've Sorry, I've got but... something to uh, say about the um, a application of these types of things. Here, just recently, uh, we had a Plymouth Salem High School soccer team. Okay, um, uh, raised money to build stadium seating. 
so they could watch from above a black chain-link fence that made spectating difficult. Now, the parents were the ones who raised the money. They're the ones who actually installed the new bleachers and a new scoreboard for the baseball field on which everyone played. Now, this was for the boys' varsity team. Now they're being forced to tear it down because the U.S. Education Department's Office for Civil Rights opened an investigation following an anonymous complaint. So the officials came in and demanded that the seating and the scoreboard be torn down because the upgrades, which I must say were raised with private money and put together with private labor, were considered superior to the Plymouth girls' softball facilities. Now, supposedly the uh, seating is also not handicapped accessible. But what we're seeing here is we're, we're looking at the, the, the government coming in and, and dictating to these schools where private funds can go at this point. Mm -hmm. And um, just to kind of piggyback on, on that, I, I think it's important to keep in perspective, if you read the actual law, the, the federal law, Title IX, uh, which was established in 1972, the actual letter of the law is, in my perspective at least, is, is perfectly fine. It's, it's not the law itself that is the problem, but rather a lot of the guidelines that are used to clarify what the purpose of the law is that come down from the Department of Education, including and especially the uh, the OCR, the Office on Civil Rights. Uh, it, it's that it's those guidelines that are the problem, and perhaps uh, speaking to the larger point, it's, it's also more of the culture of our educational institutions, and really um, how one-sided the gender advocacy has become in, in academia that gives them this, this power to, to enforce these laws or enforce these policies and guidelines so, so arbitrarily and so one-sidedly. And uh, as I believe it was Hannah was saying, in, in many cases, it, it has indeed become a case where, you know, if, if the boys have more, more interest in sports and the girls, you know, not, not so much, uh, then, yes, the boys' sports teams are cut. And it really has become a, sort of a, a really kind of a petty kind of, you know, well, if I can't have it, even if I don't want it, then you can't have it either. And that's really not the way to do, <laughs> that's really not the way to do equality. And Title IX was established to create, or rather to safeguard, educational opportunities and to not deny people educational opportunities on the basis of sex. But what we are seeing in these, in these, you know, if I can't have it, you can't have it either in regards to male sports teams and so forth, uh, it is actually turned into a way to deny, uh, to not deny uh, boys in, in, in the current uh, academic, social, climate, educational opportunities. Yeah, that certainly seems to be the case. Um, and as uh, Sage was saying, it appears to be that it's very unevenly applied. And um, <laughs> this is really this is really the situation when these laws get proposed: is that you you see them coming down the pike, and you know that they're not going to be fairly applied. And it almost seems like it needs to be considered how the law seems to end up being distorted when it gets applied before we even create these laws. But then that, that, that opens up another can of worms. Go ahead, Rachel. Well, actually, the thing about it, this is, is that, well, especially with the martial arts courses and the rape aggression defense thing, we know why they're doing this. It's because they assume that men are always the ones that rape. That's what this really is about. And uh, even the one that was in question, the one in, um, I think it was California, it was actually brought about, it was being done through, uh, I think, on police property in a police station. So it's state, it's state property. And um, one of the other things is that, it's, I think it's supposed to be for a Rape Awareness Month. So this is just about offering services to one sex, and not the other. 
Uh, well, but the but the other thing is that it's the assumption that men are not well, in danger. Yeah, the assumption that men are the ones who, who always rape and men are never in danger. So that's that's the real problem. Well, yeah, and it's really not borne out by the statistics. I believe that men are at least three times, is it, more likely yeah. to be, to to be subjected to some form of uh, violent crime, and something like five times more likely to die a violent death. So. Uh, Self-defense would, would make a lot of sense to, to help uh, college men. In fact, there's that, uh, well, they don't really know if, if it's a killer, if it's a serial killer, but the smiley face uh, killer, do, have, have you guys heard about that one? It's a, uh, it's a theorized killer of, um, of college men, and what's been happening is they've been finding all of these college men who've been drowned in fairly shallow water near, uh, near, in college towns. And, of course, if it was wom- women, there'd probably be a lot more investigation into it. But, but anyway, the, the whole idea that college men don't, are invulnerable, invincible, is, uh, is, is completely not, not, uh, not borne out by the statistics. And me- college men could use a, uh, a self-defense they they can honestly use some self a self defense. Uh, in fact, I I don't know how what kind of self defense you could use to help college men in in some of the sexual situations that that college women put them in. Um, because I mean, how, what what do you do if you're a college man and and a woman doesn't say no for an answer and keeps ag- aggressing against you and getting and getting more physically aggressive? If you fight back. Um, she can say, I mean, you're going to go to a tribunal on the college campus and, and you're going to get kicked out because she can say, oh, he, he attempted to rape me. Look at these bruises and you're screwed. And, uh, yeah, it's just, it's, it's, it's a really thorny situation and it all starts with this idea that college men are invulnerable. And um, it's a really unfortunate attitude. Alice, go ahead, Alice. Your first hey. time talking. Yeah. <laughs> It seems to me that they're too busy teaching, you know, college boys that they're potential rapists and potential abusers to try and teach them that they can be, you know, defending themselves from people like this. They're too busy accusing them of being that way to teach them how to defend themselves. And it's it's really bizarre, just the whole situation, you know, there's really, guys are stuck in a catch-22, you know, they're damned if they do, they're damned if they don't, because if their aggressor is a woman, it doesn't matter what they do, because whatever she says is what is accepted by society. Yeah, and, and how, do you, how, do you, how do you practice self-defense against that? It's, it's impossible. It's an impossible situation for, for men to be put in, and there's not really nothing they can do except be really careful about the women that they, you know, go, go become alone with and actually get told. And, Ray, and uh, Hannah has talked about this. Hannah and, uh, uh, Han- yeah, definitely Hannah has talked about um, how men aren't really told that they need to vet the women that they hang around. That they aren't necessarily that they aren't vulnerable, and they should actually be careful about the the the, t- the, the personality and the type of the char- the quality of character, um, uh, the quality of character of the women that they he- that they hang around with, and they're never told that this is something that they should do, and maybe that's part of a self defense class. That would be a part of an excellent self defense class for a man. Uh, for college men is to talk to them about the kind of behavior that women who engage in these predatory and proxy violence, as uh, John the other calls it, the proxy violence behaviors. And and uh, go ahead, Hannah. I'm going to just let you pull you in since I'm actually talking about you. You might as well explain your thoughts and people can get them right from the source. Well, there's one other thing I wanted to say about this, and, and it's, it's kind of important simply because I, I have been talking about uh, how important it is for young men to learn that they, they do need to vet women for trustworthiness, for character, before they, they offer their trust and, and, you know, set their hearts out to be stomped on. But the other aspect of this is that feminists shame men for vetting women for character not just with the, the slut-shaming dialogue, but they do apply the, the, the slut-shaming dialogue where it, it is not, um, it's not really merited. Like if your girlfriend cheats on you and you say, hey, you cheated on me, 
they will call that slut shaming. Uh, but this this is a problem for young men in in a, a variety of ways because they're they're not just not told that they should vet women for character before uh, before becoming intimate or before offering their trust, but because they are are shamed for doing so, and also because they're they grow up with this this lesson that character is is kind of a universal thing among women that all women are angels that that you know they shouldn't even think that women are bad you know bad people with bad intentions or or any such thing it's only men who who do bad things and this is something that this this not only makes young men vulnerable um just on the basis that they're going to be blindsided when somebody does take advantage of them but it also makes them vulnerable because when they start trying to talk about it, everybody else is going to act like they're making things up. They're going to act like they're slandering someone who doesn't deserve it, um, or they're going to accuse them of wimping out. And it, it becomes a whole circle of of uh, really keeping them down, keeping them from being able to defend themselves against any dysfunctional behavior in females and so not only do we need to teach guys to to watch out for for character and this is this is basically you know the same thing that you would be expected if you're a guy you know that you're expected to uh, keep your word you're expected to be grateful when someone does a favor for you you're expected to pay your debt you're you're expected to acknowledge when you make mistakes. These are things that you should expect from a woman if you're thinking of partnering with her. And but but anyway, um, the other thing that that young men need to be taught to be ready to defend against is the accusation of being the bad guy when they defend themselves against dysfunctional female behavior when a woman lies about them or when a woman steals from them, when a woman um, commits a betrayal, whether it's it's lying to them, cheating on them, anything like that, um, they need to be ready to you know, stand up for their right to be treated as human beings. And when people turn around and say, you know, how can you criticize her? She's just a woman. You know, they ought to be able to, they ought to have the power to stand up and say, well, you know, why why are you expecting me to take this? You know, I'm as human as she is. So we have really a lot to put together to to teach young men self defense against dysfunctional behavior, against abuse committed against them by women. One thing that I wanted to add to this is I learned when I was speaking with the university relations over at Kennesaw State that it is possible to uh, to prompt the public safety department to dedicate some resources toward helping the student body assuming that the support is not already there and that you obtain a minimum of 10 signatures ver with verified student IDs so in theory you could get 10 signatures to say we are a bunch of guys that are worried that we will be say falsely accused of rape or sexual assault and have our reputations destroyed and this could be done as an effort to inform them that investigations should be fairer but I do not know if that is what will happen and I think that one thing I would encourage any listeners who happen to be college students to do, and I'm going to do this myself, is to try to find if there's what the process is for prompting the public safety department to act in this way and to see if they will respond as adequate, uh, I guess you could say, immediate representatives that act just in time according to problems that are politically salient. And I'll go ahead and give, we'll give away the floor with that. Yeah, it's the the um, the hypocrisy in all of this is amazing to me. Uh, recently, uh, a lot of you may know about this particular altercation that I uh, that I, it ended up happening um, in relation to Janice Fiamenko's discussion or talk that she gave at the university, uh, Queen's University in Toronto. Uh, she gave a talk on how we need to move away from feminist double standards to help 
men and boys and men and boys in college as well and and she actually explicitly said we need to stop the war on college men and uh and as she was decrying these double standards um one uh, and she was heckled at both of her both of her lectures the first lecture the hecklers managed we met the uh, people who were putting on the lecture managed to contain the hecklers but at the end one of the uh, in the second lecture the hecklers actually managed to get it shut down with their classic maneuver of pulling the fire alarm in order to facilitate free speech they had to suppress free speech but in the first uh the first lecture that she gave a feminist philosopher uh, a feminist professor of philosophy named Adele Mercier Adele Mercier actually spoke. She was the first person who spoke when it was the question and answer period was opened up. And she just, she was disgusted by what Dr. Fiamenko was saying about not getting, get moving away from feminist double standards and how she just couldn't believe that Dr. Fiamenko knew any feminists like the feminists that Dr. Fiamenko was describing having these horrible double standards. And this is what was, once again, her name was Adele uh, Mercier. And I ended up uh, in um, one of the comment sections on a letter to the editor. Um, <laughs> in the Queen's University newsletter, news, newspaper, they put a letter to the editor who was essentially supporting Adele Mercier's opinion that we needed to main, that uh, men shouldn't have the ability to discuss men's issues outside of feminist oversight. And to that, I used my usual rebuttal, which was a list of, uh, of statistics indicating the prevalence of uh, female and male sexual violence. And the fact that m feminists just ignore it. They, they don't see it as an issue large enough to put into their, uh, their campaigns on so-called sexual assault awareness. Uh, they would prefer to present um, college men as more likely to be rapists than they are rape victims. And so I put those statistics up. And lo and behold, a commentator who went by the name Adele Mercier replied and the the first couple replies were okay yeah we're, we're going back and forth on on interpretation of the statistics uh, part of the problem was she hadn't actually read the studies in question she was actually quoting from the PowerPoint on the studies uh, and I pointed that out and I said these this is where my information comes from here's the page number here's the table number and you know it's the usual back and forth with feminists who are trying to 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 run studies through a fine tooth comb and even invent stuff to discredit the idea that female victim female uh, perpetration is in any way important and then finally the last message she sent me was it was it was it, it was it was unbelievable she essentially argued that if there was, it, I, I offered a statistic on sexual violence in juvenile facilities, and the statistic was that 95% of male inmates, uh, boys, underage boys in juvenile facilities, describe a female attacker, or, or describe being coerced or attacked by female staff. And she said that, and she came back with, well, most of that was nonviolent. Therefore, it doesn't count. Now, now, just to just to so you understand, this is we're talking about underage boys who are being detained in a facility, having sexual relationships with adult female guards, essentially underage captives having sexual relationships with their adult female captors. And she was saying that this is not coercion and it's not rape. And this is the person who, at the end of Fimenko's lecture said that she didn't know any feminists like that. Well, apparently it's because <laughs> she is a feminist like that. And uh, Yeah, she called it consensual. She called underage boys in a box being groomed by their, their female guards for sexual relationships. She called that consensual. Um, and it, it, it just, it, it was amazing. And uh, I, I, I just, I, I was dumb, dumb, and she argued that there were no feminists with these double standards that uh, Dr. Fiamenko pointed out. And yet, 
she is exactly what Dr. Fiamenko was talking about. There is no way that if Adele Mercier was Adam Mercier, that he would have got away with saying that girls locked up in juvenile facilities can give meaningful consent. Underage girls locked up in juvenile facilities can give meaningful consent to the adult male guards who control every aspect of their life. Adam Mercier would be crucified. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to just sort of become quiet here and, and ponder what I've just said because it still is astounding to me. And uh, Alice, go ahead. Take it away. I think part of the biggest problem when it comes to the female perpetrators is that in the media and society in general, they, they try and look at them as if, oh, but see, it was a crime somehow. They, they must have been in love or, or she must have been the one who was coerced or some shit. You know, try and turn it around to where even though it's a male victim, they still try and paint him as the one who was committing the crime, no matter how old he is or anything like that. It's just, it's really bizarre how much society I mean you really want to you know talk about the whole rape culture that the feminists are always screaming about there is kind of a rape culture going on because society is accepting this happening to men it's it is and what's astounding to me is that she literally went to Fiamenko's lecture about feminist double standards and said there are no feminists who do that and then, uh, if it is her, because it could, it could be an impersonator, it's probably, I, I really doubt it, but it, it could be, there's a potential there. Um, and uh, it, it's like, she says, there are no feminists who hold these double standards. What kind of feminists do you know? This, this is academically garbage, and she holds that incredible double standard. Unless, unless she does actually agree that that underage girls can give meaningful consent to adult males who are holding them captive. Um, it's okay, Rachel. You wanted to talk, so go ahead, jump right in. It's really, really scary that they can rationalize this in their mind this way. It really is. It's horrifying because they'll say the same thing for an underage girl with, let's say, if they were in the same kind of juvenile facility there would be a public outrage. It just... I, I'm trying to wrap my mind around this, and we have women like that with these double standards and these biases heavily on these college campuses, and they're the ones who are making the decisions when it comes down to convicting men of rape or, and um, how much evidence you need to convict someone of a crime like that. And also, um, I don't know if we brought it up but, um, oh, yeah, we did. The SAVE Act, uh, the Campus SAVE Act, um, we should probably talk about that a bit more in depth. Well, 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 well Rachel, I mean, the Campus SAVE Act, uh, I'm actually thinking about that enthusiastic consent thing yeah. going through California. So, yeah. um, in other words, they're going to make every, uh, every college man a rapist yeah. uh, as long as he, if he can't actually get physical proof of her saying yes. Yeah. But... But the Campus Save Act might override that because it's federal yeah, law. Yeah, that, that's a good thing. But even that it's proposed is astounding. Yeah. But, um, but a little bit of background about that act. It's going to enforce harsher punishments, but it's going to require a lot more evidence to convict someone of sexual assault than it would have previously. Hmm. Yeah. Um, well, that's that's a good uh, point in the right direction. Um, yeah. And I'm going to just say something, and then I'm going to let Hannah get in because I can see that she wants to. Um, and this is pretty much going to set up. Um, the reality is that sexual assault on campus, for whatever reason, has a lower standard of evidence than uh, any other uh, really serious crime. Of uh, it's um, and I'm, I'll actually like Hannah speak to this because she is the one that pointed this out to me, and it's better to get it from the source. So go ahead, Hannah. Um, well, the, the thing I was actually going to talk about was the enthusiastic consent standard and why it is senseless to think uh, that that there is any benevolent reason behind imposing this standard, because when it really boils down to it, what feminists are trying to do with that is is slide the scale over a little bit at a time 
until it is physically impossible for a woman to give meaningful consent. And every time that we get to a new point of uh, this is what consent is and this is, this is the set of standards a man has to follow to not be accused of rape when he has sex, and, and, and men all over get on board with that and they start trying to comply with whatever feminists have said, you got to do this if you want to have relationships with women. As soon as that happens and, and the, uh, there's a sign that the rape statistics might go down and they might lose you know, their ability to exploit those statistics for financial gain with programs you know, to train women for you know, self-defense and to you know, tr deal with survivors and, and take back the night rallies and all that, then they start changing the standards. Um, and, and every single time that, that uh, we get to a new point like this, they're going to come along with a new set of standards. So as soon as people start following this enthusiastic consent standard, they're going to say, oh, you know, that's not good enough. Now we want, and they'll come up with something else. And they'll say enthusiastic consent isn't meaningful, and they'll give a reason. And it won't matter if it's reasonable or not, because they'll use uh, thought-terminating cliches like victim-blaming to, to try to shut people up who try to argue against it. So all yeah, this about, you know, this, this enthusiastic consent standard is really bullshit. <laughs> well, they won't stop with it. No, and they're no. not, they're not going to stop with it. They will um, keep pushing and pushing until, like I said uh, last episode, it's a war on yes. Yeah. But <laughs> until that, nothing is, yeah. is acceptable proof. But regarding your, your point on um, standards for evidence, if you look at other felonious crimes, other, other serious crimes, there are different levels of, uh, of felony. And, and it's, well, take, take murder, for instance. There's manslaughter, there's first degree murder, there's secondary, you know, there's, there's different um, standards for, for how we convict. And it depends on, uh, and I'm not sure how to pronounce it, um, but it basically depends on a legal term for intent. And I, I know Karen knows how to pronounce it if she wants to jump in and say it. Uh, and and it, it's something that feminists are trying to eliminate. Yes. Men's uh, yeah. Men's uh, yeah. <laughs> That yeah. got you out. <laughs> there we yeah. go. Yeah, Latin my was not ever my strong point. In fact, foreign languages, I, I suck at all foreign languages. I took two years of French and learned how to say uh, I don't speak French in French. <laughs> well, I but, suck at pronouncing English, so there you go. <laughs> there we are. I'm even worse. And but, that's uh, it. Honey badgers, we totally suck. <laughs> 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 and last week, y'all learned that we swallow, so... <laughs> Oh, no, wait, that was two weeks ago. Oh, ladies, oh, my God. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> that was enthusiastic, yeah. wasn't it? Oh. <laughs> okay. All right, this is becoming a silly place again. Um, I'm going to give out the like call-in number. Place. The silly place. Everybody loves the silly place. Um, okay, so the call-in number for anybody who wants to call in and actually interact with us or our guest is uh, 214 666 Six one four eight. That's two one four six 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 one four eight. And uh, again, our guest tonight is Jonathan Taylor of A Voice for Men. And uh, since we've had enough uh, um, of a round table of us uh, going back and forth, uh, I'd like to open up um, discussing stuff or asking questions directly of, of Jonathan. So, Jonathan, just just uh, just to make sure you're there. Are you there? You can hear me, right? Yeah. Yes, the sound is is considerably better. So thank you for <laughs> all whole, right. thank yeah, you for sorry. sticking sticking through with all that. Yeah, um, I'm really sorry. I thought my phone would work so much better than apparently it did. So yeah, no, the sound is 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 significantly improved. Um, so let's let's go with uh, with with uh, asking some questions. Uh, first of all, could you tell us a bit more about what you do? For those of us, those in the audience who are tuning in, who maybe don't know about a voice from voice for male students, uh, well, what a voice for male students primarily is is just an online magazine, and we talk about, well, it's mainly me doing about 
submissions from people who want to submit in anything to do with uh, it's based. The topic mainly is gender education for men and boys. Uh oh, am I breaking up a bit? Yeah, you appear to be breaking up a bit. Uh, where this is not a really this is this is sort of a jinx night for getting you on and talking. Wow. Yeah. So, well, Sage says a little. Is it a little or a lot? Uh, just, we, I can still just, understand. Just a you. little. I, I think I think we can roll through. Uh, folks, just try to try to keep the background to a minimum. And mute your mute your mics if you're not talking. Go ahead, John. Okay. All right. I closed some programs I had in the background, so maybe that'll help out. Uh, so yeah, at a voice for male students, I divide the issue in categories. So uh, there's one category is educational attainment and well-being. So that category will deal with things like graduation rates, you know, enrollment, retention, uh, but also some things like suicide and learning disabilities. Uh, another key issue or key area is institutional bias, and I divide that into four main areas, um, and that is uh, there's a well, the bias that, that works against men and boys in education works in different ways. There's gynocentrism, which is simply like female centeredness. There's sexism, which is just, you know, discrimination on the basis of sex. There's misandry, which is just overt hatred against men and boys. And then there is, uh, then there is just um, a ge the general nature or the general culture of academia, which is a conformist uh, type of type of culture which tends to impede any kind of progress for men and boys and generally a police quo. Oh, we're getting some pretty bad uh, pretty bad uh, sound problems with that. Um, Jonathan, I think we'll we'll have to uh, we'll have to see if we can get you back on, but until then we're probably gonna have to take a call. Um, James, I know that Nefinor was interested in coming on and chatting with us, so perhaps we should bring on Nefinor. All right, and uh, I'm working to transfer him over. Here we go, uh, Nefinor. Welcome to the show. Okay, Nefinor. Uh, hello, but first uh, you need to turn off the if you're if you're listening to the show in something other than the Skype window, then you need to turn it off. I got it off in the background. I turned on the volume completely. All right. Thanks. So what did you want to bring to the table, Nefinor? Well, actually, I uh, found an article that was from yesterday. It was uh, Christina Hoff Summers posted it. It's about uh, the recent events at Dartmouth College. Have you guys heard of it? On minding the why campus? Don't you, why don't you give us a rundown? Because there yeah. may be people in the audience who haven't heard of it. Well, okay, I'll just read the last two paragraphs because these are the most important parts. Fueling the outrage was the arrest of Dartmouth freshman Parker Gilbert for raping another Dartmouth student. Last week, Gilbert was acquitted after five charges against him had already been dismissed for a lack of evidence, first by the first, the prosecutor, and then the judge who presided over the case. Criminal cases obviously have a higher burden of proof than college disciplinary processes, but the remarks the jury foreman suggested that the case would have failed even under a preponderance of uh, evidence threshold. The woman's story of how the night played out, the evidence wasn't there to support it said the foreman in an interview. To the contrary, it was more in Parker's favor. And then, how did the activists at Dartmouth College respond with a lengthy statement, still labeling the accuser as a victim, denouncing the jury, demanding a cultural shift, and what, what would be considered a crime? The statement also denounced Gilbert's lawyers, noting the t amount of time and resources utilized by the defense to break her down is rarely exhibited in a case like this, where so few facts are in question. Well, what do you expect? Nothing but guilt is say, going to appease them. Yeah, uh, if Gilbert had been convicted, the message would have been need to address rape culture at Dartmouth. With Gilbert acquitted, the message was the need to address rape culture at Dartmouth. Facts that appear don't matter. Well, it's 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 the usual situation, like the "Don't be that guy" campaign. It's a witch hunt. Uh, a witch. Yeah, it's a. It's a witch hunt that's always justified, right? No matter if you find witches or you don't find witches. If you find witches, well, there's, there, there's, there's obviously an epidemic of witches. If you don't find witches, there's obviously an epidemic of witches that can't be found. You know, it's, it, it, and it, it reminds me of the Don't Be That Girl can or That Guy campaign. Because uh, in, oh, yeah, I believe it was... completely garbage. 
Yeah, well, in uh, one Canadian city, the Don't Be a Guy Can't Tame corresponded with a decrease in, viol- in rapes, in reported rapes. Of course, what they don't report is that, is that year there was a decrease in crime overall, not just rape, but all forms of violent crime. And uh, in, another, in another city, it corresponded with an increase. And what they said was in the city that it corresponded with a decrease, that meant that fewer women were being raped. And in the city that it corresponded with an increase, that meant that more women felt capable of reporting their rapes. So no matter what happens, the Don't Be That Guy campaign is justified. Yeah, it's just complete bullshit. They're coming up with excuses for everything. And uh, well, in another article I read uh, recently... We even ha- they even have a name for that now. Uh, this was in regards to uh, the sexism of not enough college professors being women. They said, it's dangerous, Douglas, uh, Douglas argues, because it gives rise to enlightened sexism. Enlightened sexism allows women to be treated differently than men by trotting out an oft recited canard. If women aren't as well represented or as well compensated as men in particular, that's, because, that's not because of structural inequities. It's because women are making choices that hinder their career development. So in other words, whenever you use logic, it's now enlightened sexism. Well, they're, they're kind of doing the same thing with this as they are um, with the, the previous story. And what they're really doing here is, is saying that women are entitled to whatever women ask for, and men are not entitled to be recognized as humans. You know, related to the, the previous story, the, the Dartmouth College. Well, some of us aren't humans, so, you know. <laughs> well, okay, so human or alien. Um, but Thank but you. still, as living organisms with the, you know, very basic living rights, how's that? Um, there we and, go. And if you look back at the Dartmouth story, what they've basically said is the moment a man is accused of sexual misconduct, he no longer has the right to be considered not criminal. He doesn't have the right to a defense. He doesn't have the right to have evidence considered. He doesn't have the right to a hearing, much less a fair hearing. We should just accuse and convict. That is what they're advocating by coming out against a verdict they don't like in the face of not just a preponderance of evidence against it, but the, the, the... uh, the uh, form of the juror came out and basically said her story doesn't doesn't match the events of the night. So what he's really saying, he couldn't even as a as a citizen of you know the the community come out and say I think this woman lied. He couldn't say that. He couldn't say she lied. Her story doesn't match the events of the night. Her story doesn't hold up to the events of the night. That's a, a nice way of dodging around saying she lied. Exactly. So we're in a situation where we can't even acknowledge that an accuser may have lied, that an accuser said something happened that didn't happen, or said something happened in a way that's different than the way it actually happened. We can't acknowledge that. And feminists are going ape shit because evidence was presented and people made a decision based on that evidence. And, and because the, the accused was afforded a defense, that's sad. I mean, that's pretty sick. So we're here to the point, and it's the same thing with these professors and, and this imbalance, you know, where we can't talk about women's decisions and, and treat women's decisions as something that women are responsible for and women are empowered to make and that, that the results of those decisions are, are women's territory, that we, we own the results of our decisions. If I hit myself in the thumb with a hammer, that's my pain that I caused myself. Somebody else didn't do it to me. If I take a job I don't like, that's my job that I decided to take. Somebody else didn't put me in that position. And the idea that we cannot even discuss that, that we have to find a way to blame it on men, is not only anti-male, it's anti-female. It's, it's anti-agency. You know, the idea that we are in control of our own lives. So they're really doing the same thing with both of these situations. They're, they're uh, like I said, they're, they're entitling women 
to um, to just have without without earning, without deserving, to just have. And they're denying men the right to exist and, and the right to to do and be and be treated as equals. What I really love, though, is the fact that they are actually calling it enlightened sexism, which actually carries the implication that the stance of logic is enlightened and that the opponents of it are not, log are not enlightened. So they're actually calling themselves unenlightened while complementing uh, logic at the same time. I um, would like to go ahead and uh, rewind a bit and kind of uh, add some more, uh, contribute more to what you were saying about the addition of female professors on demand. Down here over in Atlanta, we just had a convention called Great Wide Open. And this had to do with getting more, it, it had its own talks about getting more women in technology as well. And it had, a lot of the narrative that, come, that came from that uh, discussion, a lot of it came from this fellow named uh, Clay Johnson, who wrote a book and tried to get, uh, just try to get women into technology because women have to be there. And it's one, it gets to the point where you end up hearing people say women are supposed to be the majority of college professors, they're supposed to be in technology, they're supposed to be here. And eventually, they become, they do become the tyrants, they become the people who tell women what to do, while at the same time, claiming to advocate for their individual freedom and for their own career development and what have you. But because of the, what the narrative we set, we again add another claim that we're not allowed to say, can't just leave it all alone leave it alone. Maybe they're the tyrants. Maybe they're the ones that are the, the ones that actually are assigning roles and making life miserable. But again, we're not allowed to say that. So that's pretty much all I have to say on that front. Okay, thank you, Sage. I'm going to try uh, pulling in Jonathan again and seeing if we can get that uh, interview, that aborted interview um, started again. Jonathan, are you there? Hi. Hi. Can Hi. you hear me okay? I can hear you. You're a little muffled. Well, you're not muffled. You're low, so I would suggest you have to speak up and be very clear. Okay. All right. So, All right. again, so, yeah. could you could you tell us a bit about what what you do at a Voice for Men or Voice for Male Students? <laughs> All right. Sure. Yeah. What a Voice for Male Students mainly is is an online publication that advocates educational equity for men and boys, and and what I do is I divide it into three main areas. Uh, area one is educational attainment and well-being. So that could be anything like graduation rates or uh, differentiated instruction or rather what learning styles, um, what learning styles boys and girls uh, work best with. And uh, I could also refer to things like suicide, like um, where there's a horrible problem in uh, with boys committing suicide, that uh, I believe it is four times the rate uh, that that girls commit suicide at, and um, that's so that's educational attainment and well-being, and that's just one big part of the picture. Uh, another, <clears throat> excuse me, another area is institutional bias, and there's many different types of institutional bias, and and I try to cover as many different types as I can. It's not just it's not just misandry, hatred of men and boys. There's also sort of an implicit bias or... Hey, hello? Sorry, was someone trying to say something? Okay, no, sorry. someone is trying to say something. Can continue. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so, and on top, and the third area is rights and protection. And that involves things like what we've been talking about, um, whether they are afforded any kind of substantive due process when it comes to wrongful accusations of sexual misconduct, whether it's harassment or sexual assault. And um, so that's mainly it. There's also issues of, of free speech and uh, just some extreme punishments with, with boys in lower education. Um, really, it, there's, a lot of, there's a lot to it, and um, it, it's hard for me to even attempt to try and cover it, mostly by myself, but um, I do what I can. Thanks, thanks. Um, so what got you started in your activism? Well, I was a teacher at 
uh, I was a university instructor of uh, composition and argumentation. And I was also a master's student at the time. And I was taking classes from some of my uh, feminist professors. And the kinds of things that they were trying to read into the literature that uh, that we were studying and some of the things that we were writing, the, the kinds of sexism that they would try to infer in it, uh, just, just struck me as, as really way out in left field and just, just totally unsupportable, unsupportable by, by evidence. And so my first, my first introduction to feminism was in, in academia, not in, not in the internet somewhere. Uh, so, uh, once, once I, encountered that bias in academia, I began to see if there was more out there, and I was amazed by how much I found. So, uh, and once I found more and more, I just decided to start compiling it, and the, the end result is the, the videos and, and then ultimately the website. Okay. Um, just uh, just a, 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 a statement or a, a bit of an update on the sound. We're going to need you to, to be a little bit louder. Um, uh, it's just a little bit muted, but so far so good. Um, so we know that it's tough being a college student, but what can you tell us about the current environment of hostility that young men face these days? And what can you add to what we've already discussed? Well, there's a lot of, there's a lot of activism that goes on by some of the more extreme feminists in academia, and there, there, so there's that. And sometimes that's present in, you know, like anti-rape culture rallies by students. Uh, sometimes it's, it's manifested in some of the, some of the very anti-male seminars that, or orientations that male students are in some cases required to attend. In, uh, but really I, I think that the, the big bias isn't so much a kind of overt hatred against men and boys in academia but really more like a, a lack of compassion, a lack of empathy toward them that we would have if they were women facing similar situations. So, and, and you can see that in, for example, the really the negligence and the reluctance of education administrators to address the, the disparities in, say, graduation rates and enrollment and, and things like that. Oh, then I'm going to give you a, a lowball question here. Title IX, for those of you that don't know, and they probably will by the by the by the entire conversation that has come before, but we'll we'll go we'll announce it again. Title IX, for those of you who don't know, is a law in the U.S. that states that basically you cannot be excluded from an educational activity on the basis of race or gender. Would you say that this law has helped or hurt us, Jonathan? Oh, you know what? That's a tough <laughs> question. Because the law, the law on its face, as it is written, there's, there's not, I can't really think of anything that's wrong with the law itself. I, I think the bigger problem is, is the culture that, in, that enforces it in a very one-sided fashion. So I, I think of, I think of the law as, as really kind of in, inconsequential in the bigger picture. Um, it, it's not that it, it's helped or not helped, it's really that it, it kind of, I think it kind of takes a back seat uh, it, due to the fact that, um, you know, it's, it's kind of like asking it, you know, the laws can be whatever whatever they are, but if you don't have a culture which is interested in enforcing it, you know, it, it really doesn't really doesn't matter. The, the problem is the culture itself, and and so the, the law is just a symptom. The, the law of Title IX, whether it's ultimately good or bad, is really just a symptom of that culture. That's my perspective. All right. Thanks. Um, so you had an interview with a Title IX coordinator that you taped. Could you tell us a bit about uh, what ha what occurred during that interview and some noteworthy points that you found out? <laughs> yeah, sure. So um, the university that I was formerly a student and formerly teaching at was Texas A&M University, and they have several different satellite universities, and I was teaching and studying at the one at Commerce in Texas. And um, anyway, so after I quit working in academia, I decided to kind of go back and do this 
and sort of ask this title, the Title IX coordinator at A&M University uh, what uh, about all of these things that I had questions about uh, regarding their sexual misconduct policy and also the the April 4th, 2011 Dear Colleague letter which had come out of the Department of Education which drastically cut, cut short uh, due process rights for those who were wrongly accused of sexual misconduct, including sexual assault. And I was amazed that she spoke to me for, for about an hour about this. And she made some interesting, uh, an interesting admissions into some of the activity, the activity of some of the administrators. And um, in my perspective, it culminated in a question uh, at the end where I asked her about the, about the April 4th Dear Colleague letter. And I asked her, you know, regardless as to whatever the, um, whatever the liabilities are, because Title IX coordinators, they're partially like, you know, feminist ideology enforcers, but they're also partially like CYA, you know, covering the rear ends of their institutions. I said, you know, taking rules and regulations out of the picture, uh, do you think this policy was justified? And she looked at me in the face and said, the equivalent of, I can't answer that. And that was one of the things that I got all on recording. And uh, I managed to bring it out in the in on the Internet, and um, that was the subject of an earlier of which were men radio uh, news and activism segment. Wow, that's pretty incredible. Oh, it looks like I've got some feedback going on. So, well, nope, it seems like it's it's fixed itself. Why do you feel there's such an aversion to men's rights within academia? Is it more just more than just the influence of feminism? I know that you talked about toxic misandry and gynocentrism, but why do you think that there's more there's an aversion to men's rights? Can you can you nail it down to anything specific, or do you think it's just a wide range of of, of converging issues? You know, it's 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 hard to nail it down to anything but. Feminism. I, I really hate to. I really don't like to present things in in a very simplistic fashion. But the reality is that there's just not a lot of other uh, um, there's not a lot of other people who are talking about gender in academia. There's not a lot of people who a lot of other people who are sort of the watchdogs of gender. It really is. It really is feminism that that is sort of at at the helm in most cases. And um, to a certain degree, uh, it, it's also some people who are afraid of change, who are comfortable where they are. They, and, um, you know, change is, is difficult for some people. There's also just the general conformist nature of academia. But I, I think feminism has, has the, the way that feminism is set up now in this sort of uh, zero-sum approach to to, gen, to resolving gender equity issues, it, it really compounds the problem in, in so many ways and makes it so much worse. So I, I hate to say it, and you know I I like I like presenting things in a more nuanced way, but you know more often than not, far more often than not, I think it's mostly due to the cultural influence of feminism. Well, one one thing I want to add is that you know a little bit of nuance is that. Uh, one of the reasons feminism has been so unbelievably successful is that it plays on and manipulates a whole host of traditional notions of gender, right? And so it, it will actually have, I mean, like, what is the Man Up uh, program? What is the White Ribbon campaign? Those are chivalry. The, those are chivalrous uh programs, chivalrous organizations that are all about protecting and, and, and coddling these poor defenseless women. And feminism has this insidious way of appealing to that part of traditionalism while it's also right? So I mean like this is one of the things that it like feminism would not have gotten as far as it has in corrupting academia, in corrupting all of these aspects of society, if they did not have some kind of appeal to traditional values uh, and traditional ways of looking at gender, I, you just wouldn't you wouldn't see them being so successful. So that that's really what 
I, I think is uh, is going to add nuance to the conversation is that you know feminists and and trad cons make strange bedfellows, but they seem to love the BDSM. You know, like they they seem to really get off on each other in very particular ways. And uh, and feminism takes all kinds of political advantage of that, and and they they have managed to uh, co-opt our natural instincts and co-opt our sort of uh, the traditional basis of how we've always viewed things, and uh, and turn that to their advantage. So I don't think it's feminism alone. I think it's feminism plus the enabling of traditionalists, and especially the enabling of men. Um, men, white knights, they, they let them get away with it. They, they willingly participate. They ramp up the, the rhetoric. You know, it, it wasn't uh, Hillary Clinton that sponsored the Violence Against Women Act. It was Joe Biden, right? It was Joe Biden who admitted that he'd been abused by his sisters as a child and had been told... It's never okay to hit a girl, right? Yeah, I I agree that feminism builds on top of that. They build on top of the traditional notions of chivalry. And if if we were talking about, like, say, uh, misandry or gynocentrism in, say, uh, the religious establishment, then I would I would I would very much be in agreement that feminism plays more of a shared role with other things. Um, but um, and and I really see um, feminism though as sort of like traditionalism on steroids, and um, and feminism takes mm, feminism has taken that and they have changed the converse. They have rather t- taken those traditional notions of chivalry and they have really just forced it that that perspective on a lot of academia. So uh, I think what you're saying definitely that there's definitely something to that. Uh, but I guess it all depends on how you look at it. I would like to um, I would like to ask a question for uh, Jonathan, and I kind of came up with it as we've been listening, as we've been uh, listening to the interview. And um, first, I, of course, I would like to thank you for coming coming on in. It's wonderful to have you here as the guest. But I wanted to um, I've noticed uh, through different struggles in academic journals, particularly the struggle for uh, Adam Jones, a researcher in British Columbia. He had been trying to submit his research on male victimization in international relations, but his publications were often denied through the peer review process through a unanimous rejection by feminist scholars. And a lot of it, a lot of the presence of feminist scholarship and pe- the peer review process, especially in social sciences and political science, tends to come from a uh, feminist standpoint theory. That is, the uh, feminist standpoint theory is basically summed up as trying to define social sciences in terms of women's perspective only. So it's textbook gynocentrism. So my question to you, John, is what would be the process, if you're aware of it, for uh, introducing alternative perspectives into the peer review process? And can it be done in a way that is that can that can realize a more balanced peer review process within, say, a decade? I don't know about within a decade. I, I think this is going to take, really, the, the old generation of academics, and they have to go away. And they have to retire. They have to, yeah. Uh, and I think that's going to take more than 10 years. I think it's going to take probably 15 to 20. That's just my perspective. And it's, it's going to take uh, people who are, who are advocating uh, for men and boys in, in an academic fashion, in a very, <laughs> James, now James in the text, the conversation, but um, yeah, um, yeah, a lot of them have tenure. So it's, it's not like they're going to be going anywhere anytime soon. Tenure is being phased out by the way, in a lot of educational institutions. So that presents yet another, another stumbling block for those who are trying to counter the status quo. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it, it's just going to take the passage of time, and it's just going to have to take, uh, pro- probably in my perspective, probably 10 to, or rather 15 to 20 years before we start seeing a real like critical mass uh, shift in 
in academia, in higher education specifically. I hope that answers your question. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm yeah, not sure it exactly did. In, in, in many, uh, in some ways, it does answer my question. But there are some. Um, but I do think that other questions come as a result of it as well. And there's um, one that I have in mind. If you all don't mind me keeping the floor for just a moment longer, um, sure. when it comes to um, when it comes to people, uh, feminism in this position, it it stands to reason that they are horizontally integrated, and it could and it is essentially comparable to a monopoly from my perspective. So, if in the event that this horizontal integration stands directly in the way of objectivity, isn't there any sort of grievance process that would, in some way, allow for the introduction of more diverse mindsets using feminist's own narrative against them. Diversity, that is. Well, I'm not sure if, if that's the direct, if, if using their narrative against them is, is best in all respects. But I do see some signs of hope uh, coming from certain areas of academia. For example, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the case of Mike Adams, who was denied tenure, I believe, uh, from the university he was working at. He wrote the book, the hilarious book, uh, Feminists Say the Darndest Things. And I, I highly, highly recommend it if you want a good laugh. And, um, yeah, he was denied tenure for his, his columns in, um, I, I think it was Town Hall, uh, an online magazine. And, um, Anyway, it was just recently, uh, I think it was the Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education or Minding the Campus, one of those two came out with this story about how he was able to sue and win on the basis of viewpoint discrimination. So I think in the, uh, when it comes to notions of intellectual diversity and viewpoint discrimination, I definitely see uh, a road, an inroad there, although not, a, not in all cases. But uh, there, there's that. Uh, what we saw happen at the University of Toronto and just in, in Canadian universities generally, that has, that has done a lot to raise awareness of the need for, for advocacy for men and boys in academia. And um, so it's, it's inroads like that. I mean, it's going to have to come from a, a lot of different ways, from a lot of different angles. I tend to adopt the perspective that an indirect method is generally better than a direct method. So um, so I, I think that's why I think stressing things, well, working with organizations like FIRE, stressing things like individual rights, um, it, it can't be just us men's advocates alone working on these things. I, I think eventually we have to branch out and, and build a coalition of sorts about these things. And I think that eventually will uh, break the dam, so to speak. Well, uh, thank you for answering my questions. I uh, do not have any others. Thank you, Jonathan um, and Sage. Uh, so here's a, another question for you, Jonathan. Can you tell us a little bit about the way policies are changing in regards to the way schools are now handle, handling allegations of rape and harassment? I know that we've covered some of them, but maybe there are a few that you know of that we don't. So, Yes, I have a list. If you go to my website... There's a, on the menu it says know the issues and then there's a link. Okay, before, under, before you go on, before you go on, could okay. you give us the, the, uh, the actual address of your website? Oh, yes, sorry, a voiceformalestudents.com. Okay, that's a yes. voiceformalestudents.com. Okay, go ahead, Jonathan. Yes, and if you look under the know the issues tab and you will see after that a, a link that says Summary of Educational Equity Issues for Men and Boys. Just hover over, uh, a menu will pop out to the right, and then just go down to where it says Rights and Protections, and it'll have a list of, of policies uh, that, that really work against men and boys. And some of it comes from the federal level. Some of it comes from the, like that individual university level. Um, perhaps the most problematic is the, uh, dear colleague letter, the, the guidance letter sent out by the Department of Education that we've, we've been discussing, which, which lowers the burden of proof needed to uh, run out a male student who's accused of sexual misconduct. But at some universities, uh, for example, Occidental College has a policy where they state that when it comes to uh, consent and sex, 
that uh, no means no, but yes doesn't always mean yes. So they have these these uh, double standards when it comes to defining consent. Uh, some universities adopt uh, broad definitions of sexual assault that are not reflected in the laws anywhere. Uh, like, for example, uh, Antioch College and Gettysburg College and St. Louis University, they have what's called an affirmative consent policy. And what that means is if if the if the woman does not consent by verbally answering yes, then it's rape. So if if she nods her head, if the man says, do you want to have sex? And if she nods her head, if she winks at him, if she pulls him toward him, but she doesn't explicitly say yes, that's regarded as sexual assault. Um, and it's it's not just in how sexual assault is defined, but also some of the training materials are very biased against men and boys. I believe it was Stanford University that that had some of their training materials uh, for those who sit on these panels, which convict you know men and boys who are wrongly accused. Uh, one of these the instructional material said that if, I don't know how, how is the wording, I, let me see if I can find it. Um, they said that if, uh, if someone was arguing their case logically, um, I wonder if I can find it here. Yeah, uh, if an accused person is acting persuasive and logical, it is usually a sign of guilt. And um, the training materials also said, quote, everyone should be very, very cautious in accepting a man's claim that he has been wrongly accused. So it's there, there's all these different ways that they that they come at you wh when it comes to reducing or short circuiting due process on campus, and it's it really is like a kangaroo court. There's there's really no other way to put it. Well, what's interesting, and I just want to speak to this before I, I cede the floor to Rachel because she's she's been waiting patiently to ask another question. What's interesting to me about this the the feminist approach to assault is at simultaneously with pretty much attempting to make every instance or every way of saying yes, except the most narrowly defined way. So they're narrowing and narrowing and narrowing how women can say yes, consent to sex. Um, at the same time as they're doing that, they seem to be simultaneously denying the, the scope and the importance of female sexual predation on college men and boys, or just boy, men and boys, period, and almost even expanding the uh, scope of, um, of when, of, of the scope of, of the expectation of consent of men, if, if you can understand what I'm saying. For example, to use an example, one feminist that I read said that a man saying no is exercising his patriarchal privilege. So a man saying no to sex is exercising his patriarchal privilege. Yeah, it's almost like they're reducing the scope uh, that of how men can say no while reducing the scope of how m women can say yes. I just wanted to point that out, and then I'm going to cede the floor to, to Rachel. Go ahead, Rachel. Well, first off, I actually want to thank you for your entire series on misandry and education, because really, that's one of the things that got me started uh, in my activism. Uh, the second thing oh. I want to ask is, um, what advice you would give uh, for someone trying to get into this kind of activism on campus? Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess the first question would be, uh, well, also, first of all, thank you. I'm, I'm glad you like the work that I've done and the videos I've made. Uh, I'm Absolutely. glad that I was able to, to help raise awareness of, of the issues. And if you're interested in getting started on campus, uh, well, I guess the the first question would be, you know, to what degree are you looking at, say, for there, there's so many different things you can do. You could, like, say, just try to form a discussion group or try to form, like, a, like an activism group. A discussion group, for example, would just be um, a group where people come, gather together and talk, like, a, you know, twice a month about gender issues and what it means to be a man or, or you know, in, in today's society. And if, if you want to form a more controversial group, like say a, a, a men's rights group or, or a men's human rights group or a men's issues group that touches on a, a broad range of issues, 
uh, including sexual misconduct, uh, you're going to you're going to need some friends. <laughs> and um, to say the least. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, I would. Uh, you're going to need a faculty sponsor, and if possible, I would try to find those uh, not in the humanities. I would try to find those in uh, science uh, science departments or math departments, or um, just any, I would I would first look to anywhere but the humanities for help from a faculty sponsor, uh, because the reason, of course, being that not only are many teachers themselves uh, in really indoctrinated in this, this feminist perspective in the humanities, but also, even if they are not, they are still uh, sort of policed by the peer pressure of those who are. Um, and so another thing to be aware of is, is that, I mean, you're going you're to be attacked. I mean, it, it, the more controversial the, the issues are that you bring up, you're going to be attacked. And um, it, it's always useful to, you know, to state your values up front. I'm a big advocate of of a values-centered approach. Um, I would advocate values, well, like uh, on my website, I have a list of nine values, and I, I constantly refer back to that. And um, I think placing values at the center of your rhetoric uh, is a lot better than placing labels, like political labels, like, uh, like even like men's movement, labels like the men's movement. Or I think it's important to stress the notion of men's human rights but I, I also think that, you know, that should also be bound up in, in the larger conversation of, of gender equality and, and things like that. So I hope that answers your question. There, there's so much more that we could unpack with that. Um, but I hope that that helps out to a certain degree. I feel that uh, I should uh, contribute to this. I understand that we still have a caller waiting on the line, so I will try to keep this quick. But um, when it comes to so founding your own student organization, really mileage varies, and there's no one uh, there's no one formula and no one approach that's going to work for everyone. Simply because policies, laws, and even campus cultures can vary to the point of re re reducing all decisions to context. And speaking in terms of my experience with Kennesaw State University men, we um, we started with a notion of a safe space and a place where people would come talk but it it was very difficult to generate interest using this format since Kennesaw State University is almost if not exceeding 70 percent women as of this year and when you are on a in a campus culture that is very heavily predominantly female you end up having to find a way to generate you end up having to find yourself looking for ways to generate interest and it, it, I've actually found that becoming more controversial and just saying, yes, we are for men's rights, is actually useful in getting that first attention to come in. But you don't want to, you do not want to pick fights. You want to be unapologetic in your values. You want to speak unapologetically and with confidence. But going out and picking fights may lead one to trouble, especially given the dangerous campus culture that we've been discussing for this entire uh, for this entire show. So um, I, I don't want to seem like I'm interjecting or in any way trying to contradict what you're saying, Jonathan. I just feel like it was important to note that it's it, it's very uh, it's very context centric, and that a lot of the experiences that uh, come from men's rights organizations before would really be helpful if the context is similar. Yeah, um, yeah, definitely. Thank you. Thank you for lending your perspective because I know it comes from experience. And uh, so, yeah, there's, I, I, I think there's something to be said for the fact that there's no one way to, to do it. You know, there's, there's, you know, we need a, a diversity of approaches when it comes to, to this issue, uh, to these issues. So. Yes, and, and I, I appreciate both of you uh, answering that answering that question, and also the work that you are doing to bring attention to these issues and to start activism on campuses. Uh, it's very much appreciated. I know that when I started ten years ago, um, looking into these issues and and participating on, on online forums regards to men's rights issues, I didn't think that it would actually get this much traction um, in my lifetime. So it's it's I I think the growth is great. Um, 
in, in light of that, can you tell us a bit about the way policies are changing in regards to the way schools are now handling allegations of rape and harassment? Did I already ask that one? I think yeah, so. Yeah, you did. Uh, my apologies. Uh, what do you think it will take for feminists to acknowledge that some women lie about rape? Do you think that's an achievable goal? <laughs> <laughs> that is an interesting question. Um, I <laughs> don't see them, well, that some women lie about rape, I could see them acknowledge that some do. Um, and I do see some feminists acknowledge that some women lie about rape, but they overwhelmingly try to trivialize it, uh, try, to, try to dismiss it, even while at the same time they pretend to acknowledge it. So I think uh, to speak perhaps more um, more transparently to your question, like when will they afford it political weight? I, I think that's what you're really asking. Uh, when, when will they acknowledge that it has political weight and, and social weight and that it's a, a human rights issue? Not any time. I, I, I think that whenever they lose enough power and enough faith, then they will do that. But until that time, uh, it's a very big, um, it's a very big um, sympathy button for feminists. It's it's a very big way to to generate funding for the movement. Uh, it's it's one of their uh, cash cows, so to speak. It, it's their perhaps their most sacred cow. And uh, the idea that that women are the only ones that that are you know, raped, men don't get raped and that, you know, false accusations of rape are, are trivial uh, or inconsequential, yeah, they're not going to give that up without, without a fight and without losing some serious uh, social and political clout over the next, you know, 10 to 15 years. So that's really, that's really my answer, once they lose enough influence and power. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm actually reminded of an exchange I had with a feminist recently on one of the, uh, the the Facebook threads, on uh, there was a Facebook announcement of Janice Fiamengo's lecture at uh, Queen's University. And I had this exchange with a feminist, and um, she was talking about how the, the, the Don't Be That Girl campaign, and how if, uh, if men's rights activists cared about male victims of rape, they would have just reversed the sexes. And, uh, and I said, well, the reality is that the Don't Be That Girl campaign also helps victims of rape, and I'm talking specifically of those men who were raped because their rapist said, if you don't submit, I'll give, I will level a false rape accusation. And the idea that false rape accusations can be tools that rapists use, I think that probably knocked her, knocked, knocked her for a loop, um, that this is actually all a connected issue, and you can help rape victims by actually saying that no not all rape <laughs> accusations we need to have some skepticism we can't especially in a social situation outside of a, 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 a law court well and and definitely in the law court but when someone when you know uh, when someone says this person raped me we should not necessarily jump to a violent solution and believing them off off the bat I mean if support is one thing but actually addressing the, the kind of vigilantism that comes out of a, of a, of a rape accus accusation that never even sees the inside of a courtroom is another. And again, that, that the situation with some men who are raped because they are forced to submit, because a rapist says, oh, you know, if you don't submit, I'll tell them that you raped me. <laughs> yeah. And uh, she, she didn't have anything to say. I'd, she didn't really have anything to say after that. <laughs> so... Um, one, I'm going to, yeah, go ahead, Karen. One, one thing that I wanted to add, too, is that the Don't Be That Girl campaign included posters that were, uh, were direct uh, gender reversals. There was one poster in the Don't Be, Don't Be That Guy campaign that said, just because she's drunk doesn't mean she wants to fuck. And the Don't Be That Girl poster said, just because he has an erection doesn't mean he wants to fuck. An erection does not equal consent. Don't be that girl. And the only person who mentioned that poster to me in all of my discussions over it, right, in all of the controversy over it, 
was a CBC reporter uh, for CBC French language who didn't take issue or have anything to say about the message of that poster, just wanted to know, you know, why we thought it was appropriate to use the word fuck when fuck was the original wording in the original Don't Be That Guy poster, right? Don't you think it's a little bit much, a little vulgar to use the word fuck, right? Mm -hmm. That was all she had to say about it, right? Like, there were posters in our campaign that did reverse the genders. They got no attention whatsoever, other than for their bad language, which was the exact same language as in the Don't, Don't Be That Guy campaign. So, I mean, like, the entire premise that we didn't reverse the genders, right, is ridiculous. Nobody wanted to comment on it. Nobody had a comment on it. So there you go. Well, I'm not surprised. Uh, and I think it just blows their minds. It des definitely blows their minds when I argue that, you know, the, uh, we, need to, we need to take into consideration um, false rape accusations as actually a form, uh, almost a form of, well, I, I would go out and say that considering the effect that it has on men, that a false rape accusation is in itself a sexual abuse. And not just that, but that false rape accusations can be used as tools to uh, elicit compliance from a rapist's victim. And also that everybody, everybody, the, the, the victims of false accusations, the victims of rape, male and female victims of rape, transsexual female victims of, uh, uh, victims of rape, all, everybody needs to be included in the solution uh, for, for us to create a solution that works. But let's uh, move on to a caller. But before we move on to the caller, I just want to do a call out to the people listening. If you're interested in uh, participating in a Google Hangout with us, please do um, add us to your circles. Um, just go to Google Plus and look for Honey Badger Radio and click add and uh, we'll add you back. And if you're interested in following our content, go to YouTube. Um, we're uh, youtube.com slash user slash honeybadgerradio. Nothing really complex there. And go and subscribe. And we're going to have some extra special content soon. So please do subscribe. And uh, let's go to the caller now. Um, James, I know we have someone waiting very patiently. And I do apologize to him. We were having some serious technical issues. So, uh, Vagabond. Greetings, all. Okay, Vagabond. I think you might. Ha do you have anything uh, in the no, background he's, that's playing he's, the radio? He's, show? he's good to go. We're we're occasionally going to come across that that kind of lag where it takes a second for the caller to realize we're actually talking to them. Okay, that's <laughs> fine. Yeah. Oh. Okay, well, hello, super. Vagabond. What did you bring? Want to bring to the table to the topic tonight? Um. I'm going to bring a half uh, rant and uh, uh, I just and and half venting, I suppose. Okay, and before just you begin, just just speak up because you're a little bit a uh, little bit um, soft. Okay. Um, can you hear me now? Nope. Louder. I can't really do much better because the phone's right next to my face. Oh, um, okay. Well, we'll we'll deal with it. Keep going. Okay. Well, you know. Hearing all of this that we've been discussing tonight, and I'm pretty sure that Karen is familiar with this term, I'm pretty sure everyone is familiar with this term, just convinces me if we don't really, you know, really try to fight back against all of this, we are headed for a apocalypse. Because all of this that, that, I've been, that we've been discussing tonight is, is really, I, I really feel that it's an exercise in female supremacy. And um, because there's there's just but in in a in a regular sense of speaking about it uh, when you're talking about gender equality and um, uh, call even calling out double standards and showing it to them they're just overriding it completely and it's just a lot a lot of what they're saying is it can they can uh, we can get away with it because we're women and I'm and it, it's appalling. You know, I saw a, a video just over the past week where a woman walked up to a guy, blatantly pressed her breasts against him and said, get your hands off my breast, and then proceeded to uh, push him off a ledge in, in retaliation to what she started. 
Um, I don't know if everyone. Uh, I'm pretty sure uh, uh, others others in the room saw that. And um, yeah, you're you're talking about the uh, the feminist protester who was um, who went up to a pro life protester and uh, a pro life activist and essentially sexually assaulted him and then accused him of sexually assaulting her and then pushed him off the podium he was on and he ended up hitting his head and it was pretty bloody it was uh, yeah. and it, it was it was sort of a disturbing incident um yeah there's been a lot of of really aggressive actions taken by feminists against pro life protesters um and it's it's ugly the word that i use I'd straight up say disgusting. Yeah, you don't want to associate with these people, but you know, it's it's like yeah, it's it, it once your once your your position requires violence, or it, you have to silence the opposition because you can't handle what they have to say. Um, yeah, you you got to reconsider the position that you're taking. Because because if your position allows you to remove someone else's humanity, it's it there's something wrong. But but continue. Well, I mean, if I'm trying to follow the path of okay, well, exactly what what brought what brought our women to this position? It is it is a result of feminism, but specifically, and I don't really like saying this, but I'm I really suspect this a solid constant message of female empowerment over the perception the feminist perception of what men were that men were uh, you know absolutely powerful that they can be overlords in even even in regular life um you know you'd have to completely ignore what do, uh, what dr Ron farrell said that you know it's 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 a myth it's not true but they've been running with it for so long and they've been and they've been pumping in this message of female empowerment that has brought women to this point where they're just at least mentally feel like they're invincible and superhuman and just just feel like they can get away with this stuff and it's it's uh, it, it you know it makes me want it makes me feel like I'm about to have an aneurysm when I'm when I see all this stuff but it's like and and um, when they tried to argue back, because I, I saw Dr. Fia Mango's um, recent uh, recent conference at at uh, well, what was it uh, Queens Queens University? But um, yes, it was Queens University. Uh, Queens or Ottawa? If it's if it's the one where they actually shut her down, it was Ottawa. No, I, I only saw that. I only saw that little bit of that one. To tell you the truth, but um, uh, well, there was only a bit to see, so. But at the uh, Queen's um, Queen's University one, they kept telling her that have you um, have you seen the, have you have you referenced any of the uh, any of the uh, modern speakers of feminism? And I agree with what she said. Look, it doesn't matter if what you're talking about is still motivated and deeply rooted in second wave feminism and all its ilk. It the the same the same things are going to be coming out. Yeah, it doesn't matter if they're saying the same stuff 20, 30 years later. But what I wanted to say to to uh, to that, that whole concept of patriarchy is if feminists can capture our sense of history and say men were so awful, then they can justify be, uh, being awful back. They can justify being just that awful back. And then I'm going to pull in Rachel because she's she's been waiting patiently to speak. So go ahead, Rachel. Yeah, I think that what we've done is we've really destroyed women. I, I gotta be perfectly honest, I've been thinking about this for a very, very long time. And what we're doing is we're empowering them but without expecting them to be better people. We're not expecting them to, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? We're not expecting them to be better people. We're not expecting them to be self-reliant or have integrity. We're just saying, no, you are awesome just the way you are. And they just end up with this sense of entitlement. And also, they believe that they're fighting this war against uh, the evil patriarchy. So we've got a whole bunch of just angry, furious, uh, 
terrible people. The worst parts of women going forward and that's just, just really what's happening. And they're fighting as if this was day one of a battle that never really started. Yeah, and and really, it, it, that like I said, it's that it, you, if you make patriarchy out to be horrible, then you can justify women being horrible to men because it's just desserts, right? It's just turn around is fair play. Um, so I'm going to thank uh, thank Vagabond for his call, and uh, I appreciate him calling in. And uh, let's move on to some more questions of, of Jonathan, our, our guest. Um, so, uh, what are some of the things that you have managed to achieve since you began on your journey um, as an activist and creating a voice for male students? Well, Jonathan? awareness. Oh, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Just speak up a little bit more. All right. Yeah, um... So yeah, one of the big things is awareness. It's, you know, knowing is half the battle, like, like they say. And so getting, a, getting this out there and putting it on the Internet and getting a decent, you know, a decent rank as far as, you know, search engine ranks, and that, that, all, that is all required in order to get your message out there. As of, um, as of right now, if you open up a Google search engine and type in male students, um, my website, A Voice for Male Students, is the first thing that pops up, at least whenever I do it. Um, I've been a guest on several radio shows. Uh, this is this is one of them, and I was also a guest at an earlier Voice for Men radio show, and I've also been a guest at other radio shows. There was there's one called Canto Talk that I was a guest at. I've been interviewed by several different uh, student publications around around the uh, United States and even even one in Canada as well. Uh, let's see. Uh, whenever uh, I covered a case uh, coming out of Goshen College about how their website demonized men under this ridiculously broad definition of rape, and I linked it to Reddit, and Reddit just took off with it. And um, sort of together, I mean, we were able to get them to change their websites. That's something important. Uh, I've been able to help people who are getting uh, men's issues groups started up on campus. Um, I think I was able to help Sage, or yeah, I think I was able to help him find uh, find someone to work with during the early stages of his group. Uh, I've been able to advise a lot of people, and uh, I get I get a lot of emails that no one else in the world sees, and that I can't show anyone else. And usually, it's from mothers whose sons have been. Uh, wrongly accused of something, or the administration has just been really heavy-handed, and um, I've been able to give them some sort of information and, and let them know that they're not alone. And um, and also the people who have been you know wrongly accused, um, sometimes they just need someone to talk to, and you know I spend a lot of time just just talking to people and um, you know letting them know that someone cares because sometimes that's really all you can do and. Sometimes that's what they need the most. Um, there's a lot of other things that I do, but I mean that's that's a lot of it. Just publishing publishing articles about the issues, getting the message out there, uh, trying to network with as many people as I can. Uh, that's most of it. Well, thanks, and thank you for everything that you do do. Um, I have one question that's sort of um, per, uh, sort of close to what I like to focus on. Have you read about the recent study on? Uh, uh, the sexually a sexual abuse experience of college men and high school boys. Would that be the one in which forty percent of them admitted to uh, being the victims of sexual assault? Yes, I have not read that yet, and that is one area in which I would like to expand the website in the future. Uh, a section which which is devoted to men and boys who are themselves sexually abused. I, well, what's I it, what? am not. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, please. You're the guest. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Um, about that particular study that you are referring to, I have not read it. I have heard, I have read some commentary on it. I've read something from Pierce Harlan at the blog Community of the Wrongly Accused, and I've heard people talk back and forth about it. Um, I think there's a tendency to get bogged down in statistics. 
whether it's statistics of sexual abuse or false accusations of sexual abuse. I think I think whenever we get too bogged down in statistics, though, we we tend to lose sight of the bigger picture, and and that is that you know it, regardless as to however many there are, it's it's still a valid issue, and we need to make sure that that there is some policy and practice put in place that safeguards the interests of of all kinds of victims, and and that includes you know men and boys who are sexually abused, and you know women as well, and um. I so I'm, I'm sorry if, if I'm kind of um, <laughs> not giving you a full answer in that regard, but that's, that's just kind of the way I see it. Well, no, I, I can understand it. I know that there's been some controversy over it, even among the people who deal with men's issues. Um, I've actually read it uh, for in a fairly went through it fairly in a fairly detailed level because I ended up arguing with it with um, a bunch of feminists and. The reality is that the one statistic that people pull out and say that this, you know, the the uh, the coercion by seduction statistic, um, if you actually read what it what it is defining, it, it is a lot worse than it sounds. Essentially, what what the way the researchers defined seduction was somebody sexually harassed, sexually assaulting someone else till they gave in. Uh, because I, I, you know, if a person indicates they don't want to be touched, and you continue to touch them, what is that? That is sexual assault. And um, right. so that 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 statistic actually is it, the way that the researchers define it sort of hide the reality. And I don't know if they intended that or they were just groping for a term, and that was groping. Uh, that was the one that they came upon. But uh, yeah, it's uh, you really have to read that study and read the way they're defining their terms. Um, and the other thing I noticed about that study is it defined it defined um, physically forced to have sex actually more strictly than the Mary Koss study that found that 7% of uh, college women said in the last year that they had been physically coerced into um, sex, uh, into sexual behaviors or intercourse or rape, um, uh, sex or uh, attempted rape, right? And um, because in the Mary Koss study, they, they indicated that it was, that it, that it included threats of violence, whereas in this current study, um, which I, I forget the title of, but... Um, it indicated only use of threats or use of blocking exits not not, not use of uh, not not sorry use of aggressive force or use of blocking exits it did not specify threats of force so i found that interesting and again that that found that 18% of college men actually 19% of college men indicated that they had been forced into either sexual assault or attempted or completed intercourse on a stricter definition of using violence than the 7% of women who in 7% of college women in Mary Koss's study who indicated the same in the last year so I thought that that was interesting. Now, the reality is that we're looking at two different statistics so again getting bogged down in the statistics that you're right. Um, there are differences. Mary Koss's survey of college women only covered the last year, whereas this particular survey covers apparently the dating, uh, the entire time that these college and high school boys have been dating. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I totally agree about not getting bogged down of, of um, not getting bogged down with statistics because it really is about helping people. And it's not really a game to see has, who has it worse. But at the same time, feminists really have made it into that with right. their theories. And, you know, it's still, <laughs> you, st you still sort of have to challenge a lot of their, their science. Like the Mary, original Mary Koss study didn't even ask men about their experiences of being victimized. It just asked, asked men about their perpetration of sexual violence. And, they, and there is even a study from the 1998, sorry, 1988, that found comparable levels of sexual victimization between men and women. Men was lower at 16% versus 22, but it was still comparable. Uh, since the 80s, we've known this, and nothing has been done. You know, we still see these campaigns that exclusively demonize college men for the rape on college campuses. 
that exclusively see college men as predators rather than potential victims. And the reality is that it seems like if you, if you look at females or you look at males, the predators are, and you look at the wild, the predators are not as numerous as the victims. For women or men, I'm, I'm, I imagine. Karen might ha might say that, that that's not true, but um, again, that's more statistics. So, no, the reality... I would, I would actually say that that's absolutely true, that the predators are never going to be as prevalent as the victims because a predator can victimize people numerous times, and we've seen this with David Lisak's uh, research into campus rapists, that uh, most, 90% of the rapes on campus are committed by recidivists, right? And, uh, and that those 4% of men on campus uh, can absolutely account for uh, even the inflated statistics uh, that, that Mary Koss has come up with. You know, like that they the fact that they offend over and over and over and over again means that there's definitely going to be a larger pool of victims than there is of rapists, right? And I think that, that that goes whether the rapist is male or female. So, oh, Well, I'm glad that we agree. <laughs> we should... We should uh, we should find more to disagree on because disagree disagreement always makes uh, a more interesting show. I was yep. hoping you would would disagree with me, and and then we could get into a cat fight, but, but Never. sadly, no. <laughs> I don't have the answer right now. <laughs> okay, so Jonathan, go ahead and make your announcement. If you, uh, it, since it, I'll give you, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, it's. I was just wanting to add something to to your question earlier. What is it? What are some of the accomplishments? One of the things that I was really glad to put together this. Uh, this year uh, is something that you can find if you go to a voiceformalestudents.com and if you look at the very top of the website there will be um, a text that, that fades in and out and it says time sensitive opportunities and I have put together a database of college and university scholarships for men and boys. I have spent many days working on it and, um, and it's the most comprehensive database you'll find anywhere. Uh, it can certainly be expanded, but yet it's, it's definitely the most comprehensive based upon what I've researched. Uh, I also have a list of, um, of men's issues, uh, symposia and seminars uh, that, that people can get involved with. So I definitely want to make sure people know that those resources are available if they're interested in building connections in academia or getting help out to, uh, to men and boys in education. So. That's it. I just wanted to uh, send my thanks. Thank you for that, Jonathan, for the database. Wonderful contribution. You're welcome. Glad to put it together. And I just want to uh, to say, James, if you want to jump in, go ahead. James. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. Well, we've got a opportunity here at AVFM Radio to pick up new hosts and new shows. We would like prospective hosts to put together show ideas. Send them in to radio at a voice for men dot com. Send those show ideas in. I will go ahead and begin a, uh, a interview process. We are starting to get people who are interested. So if you want prime slots between 8 a.m., and 8 p.m. Central Time, Monday through Friday, and half days on Saturday from 8 a.m. to noon, then you need to go ahead and send in your idea to radio at avoiceformen.com. Thanks. Thanks, James. Um, and yeah, that's uh, uh, one last question for, for uh, Jonathan. Activism like this is often an uphill battle. What keeps you positive in the face of such opposition? Well, one of the reasons that I decided to put together this website is, is my nephews. Um, I'm not a, a parent myself. I don't have any kids. But I, um, 
I do this uh, so that I have this hope that by the time they grow up, they'll, that things will have changed. And um, whenever I think about quitting, I think about them. And as cheesy as that sounds, that's that's really how it is. So, um, you know, I, I just, that's just what I do. And at the end of the day, that's kind of why I do it. So. Yeah, and you really can't, uh, can't, I mean, I know that that's sort of why I do it too. I see the people in my life and I see the people around me. And I see the people that are hurting, and it's it's something you, you feel like you have to do to make the world a little bit better. Um, and, uh, yeah, well, thank you for coming on and being part of Honey Badger Radio. And, unfortunately, it's that time again, that time to end the show. I want to thank Jonathan Taylor at A Voice for Male Students. And if you want to see more of his work, it's avoiceformalestudents.com. I want to thank him for coming on the show and taking part and listening to our questions and sharing his perspective. Thank you, Jonathan Taylor. Thank you so much for having me. Well, it, it's been a pleasure. And I also want to thank all my co-hosts for their work on the show and behind the scenes. And I want to thank James in particular for today since it's been quite the technically uh, difficult journey today. We'll put it that way. And um, I would like to thank the people who you don't see um, uh, Europa for creating the show art every week Phil for creating the animation every week our other artist Yule who's working on a very secret project that soon will be revealed and the various other volunteers who make Honey Badger Radio what it is in addition to them thank you to our donors and thank you to our listeners and our fans and if you want to become a fan go to our YouTube channel at um, Honey Badger Radio, Radio and subscribe and until then, actually, it's going to be two weeks till we see you again, and then it'll be the same bat, or sorry, ba same Badger channel, same Badger station. In two weeks, August twenty fifth, we're going to be talking to Dr. Janice Fiamengo, and we're going to find out about her experiences in Ottawa and Toronto. So tune in then. Good night. Torpedo to the jugular. This is Honey Badger Radio. Radio with bite.